Catabolism of a glucose molecule. Most cells generate ATP by breaking down carbohydrates, especially glucose. When cells consume oxygen, they can break down glucose into carbon dioxide and water. And by doing so, they provide a typical body cell with 36 molecules of ATP. The breakdown of glucose takes place in a series of small steps. The first steps begin in the cytosol of the cell. Here in the cytosol, glucose is broken down into smaller molecules in a process called glycolysis. Glycolysis does not require oxygen and so the process is said to be anaerobic, which means no oxygen. The molecules produced through glycolysis are small enough to be absorbed by the mitochondria. Once these smaller molecules are in the mitochondria, they will be involved in reactions that will use oxygen and are considered aerobic. The reactions inside the mitochondria will create most of the ATP that the cell needs to function. These reactions are collectively called aerobic metabolism or cellular respiration. Let's start with glycolysis. Glycolysis is the breakdown of glucose to pyruvic acid. In this process, glucose, which is a six carbon compound, will break into two three carbon compounds of pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid then loses a hydrogen atom to become pyruvate. During the process of glycolysis, the cells must use two ATP molecules to complete this process but will also create 4-ATP through phosphorylation. Since glycolysis uses 2-ATP but creates 4-ATP, the net ATP production during glycolysis is 2-ATP for every glucose molecule catabolized. This amount of ATP is not enough for the cell to survive, but the pyruvate molecules hold much energy that will be used in the mitochondria to create more ATP. In addition to the ATP that are produced, the process of glycolysis will lose two hydrogen atoms, which will be transferred to a hydrogen carrier called NAD. When the two hydrogen atoms are transferred to NAD, the molecule then becomes NADH. The hydrogen will be carried to the electron transport system in the mitochondria. We will discuss later what happens to the hydrogen in the NADH molecule. Glycolysis is anaerobic because it does not require oxygen and it occurs in the cytosol of the cell. If oxygen is present in the cell, the three carbon pyruvate molecules will enter the mitochondria and continue being catabolized. Once in the mitochondria, each pyruvate molecule will lose a carbon in a process called decarboxylation. This carbon will join with oxygen to become carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide will diffuse out of the cell and into the bloodstream, where it will be carried to the lungs and be breathed out during expiration. The new molecule formed is now a two carbon molecule called acetyl coenzyme A. Acetyl coenzyme A, or acetyl CoA, will participate in reactions in the matrix of the mitochondria. An enzyme called coenzyme A or CoA will carry acetyl CoA into the citric acid cycle in the matrix of the mitochondria. Recall that mitochondria are organelles with double membranes. That is, the mitochondria has two layers of membrane, the inner membrane and the outer membrane. The space in between the inner membrane and the outer membrane is called the intermembrane space. The space inside the inner membrane is called the matrix. The citric acid cycle will take place in the matrix of the mitochondria. The function of the citric acid cycle is to remove hydrogen atoms from organic molecules and transfer them to coenzymes. These coenzymes are NAD and FAD. At the start of the citric acid cycle, CoA will release the 2-carbon acetyl-CoA so that it may be transferred to a 4-carbon molecule. Together, these two molecules form a 6-carbon compound called citric acid. After releasing the acetyl-CoA, the CoA molecule is now free to pick up another acetyl-CoA. At the end of the citric acid cycle, two carbon atoms will have been removed to recreate the original four carbon compound. These carbons join with oxygen atoms to form carbon dioxide, which is a waste product of the cell and which will eventually diffuse out of the cell into the blood and be transported to the lungs to be breathed out. 
More importantly, during the citric acid cycle, hydrogen atoms will be transferred to coenzyme NAD and to another related one called FAD. NAD and FAD will be called NADH and FADH2 as they both pick up two hydrogen atoms each. NAD is a negatively charged compound and when it picks up two hydrogen ions it becomes NADH plus H plus. However, it is commonly just referred to as NADH. NADH and FADH2 will carry the hydrogen over to another area in the mitochondria to be used in the electron transport system. NADH and FADH2 release their hydrogen to the cytochromes of the electron transport system. Without the hydrogen, NAD and FAD then return to the citric acid cycle to pick up more hydrogen atoms. The only immediate energy benefit of the citric acid cycle is that one GTP or guanosine triphosphate will be created from one GDP or guanosine diphosphate. GTP is equivalent to ATP because it will readily transfer a phosphate group to ADP to create ATP. So we can say that for each acetyl-CoA, one ATP is directly created by the citric acid cycle. Of course, with one glucose molecule, two acetyl-CoA are produced. So ultimately, from one molecule of glucose, the citric acid cycle produces two ATP. The formation of GTP from GDP in the citric acid cycle is another example of substrate phosphorylation. In this process, a phosphate group is transferred to a suitable acceptor molecule using energy from a chemical process. This occurs in many reactions in the cytosol where a phosphate group is transferred to an ADP to produce ATP. For example, the ATP produced during glycolysis is generated through substrate phosphorylation. Normally, however, substrate phosphorylation only provides a small amount of ATP and isn't enough for the cell to function. Most of the ATP that the cell needs will be produced during oxidative phosphorylation, which is what we'll talk about next. Oxidative phosphorylation is the generation of ATP within the mitochondria that requires both coenzymes and consumes oxygen. This process produces more than 90% of the ATP used by body cells. The key reactions take place in the electron transport system. Oxidative phosphorylation also forms water or H2O by combining two hydrogen atoms with one oxygen atom. The oxygen is provided from the atmosphere during respiration and hydrogen is found in all organic molecules. So both oxygen and hydrogen are readily available for this reaction. The reaction of creating water releases a tremendous amount of energy. There is so much energy released that this type of reaction is used to launch space shuttles into orbit. Obviously, cells can't handle this much energy, so the energy released must be gradual. Oxidative phosphorylation proceeds in a series of small, controlled steps so that energy can be captured safely and ATP can be generated in the process. During these steps, molecules lose electrons in a process called oxidation. When one molecule loses an electron, another molecule will gain it in a process called reduction. When electrons are passed from one molecule to another, the electron donor is oxidized and the electron recipient is reduced. Oxidation and reduction are important because electrons carry chemical energy. In a typical oxidation reduction reaction, the reduced molecule gains energy at the expense of the oxidized molecule. You can remember that molecules are oxidized when they lose electrons and are reduced when they gain electrons by remembering the words oil rig. For oxidation is loss and reduction is gain. In an oxidation reduction exchange, the reduced molecule does not gain all the energy released by the oxidized molecule. Some energy is always released as heat. The remaining energy will be used to form ATP. The electron transport system starts with NADH and FADH2 delivering hydrogen atoms to cytochromes. The cytochromes are integral and peripheral proteins that are embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. These hydrogen atoms are from the citric acid cycle and were delivered by NAD and FAD in the form of NADH and FADH2. 
If you remember hydrogen atoms, they consist of one electron and one proton. The electron has a negative charge and the proton has a positive charge. The electron carries energy with it. NADH and FADH2 will both carry two hydrogen atoms. The electrons from these atoms will be passed from NADH and FADH2 to one of the cytochromes embedded in the inner membrane. The electron will then be passed from one cytochrome to the next in small steps. At the last cytochrome, at the end of the electron transport system, an oxygen atom accepts the electron and will use its energy to combine the oxygen and hydrogen ions to form water. Note that this sequence starts with the removal of two hydrogen atoms from a substrate molecule, NADH or FADH2, and ends with the formation of water by combining two hydrogen with one oxygen. This reaction occurred in several steps. Had it occurred in only one step, it would have been highly explosive. The coenzymes NADH and FADH2 transfer the electrons to the first cytochrome in the electron transport system and the electrons continue to be passed from one cytochrome to the next. As they are passed along, the electrons themselves release energy. This energy released causes hydrogen ion pumps to start working. These pumps move hydrogen ions from the matrix across the inner membrane and into the intermembrane space. This causes a large concentration gradient for hydrogen ions between the matrix and the intermembrane space. Following the rules of diffusion, hydrogen would diffuse from the high hydrogen concentration in the intermembrane space to the lower concentration in the matrix. Hydrogen can't cross the inner membrane because they are not lipid soluble. However, in the inner membrane, an integral protein with a channel called ATP synthase has the ability to permit hydrogen ions to diffuse into the matrix. This process is called chemiosmosis and it creates a kinetic energy that will be used to convert ADP to ATP. Both ADP and phosphate groups are already in the matrix of the mitochondria. The energy from chemiosmosis will be used to phosphorylate ADP, which means a phosphate group will combine with ADP to form ATP. Because this process uses both coenzymes and oxygen, the process of making ATP through this method is called oxidative phosphorylation. For every NADH molecule that transfers its hydrogen molecules to the electron transport system, three ATP will be formed. For every FADH2 molecule that transfers its hydrogen molecules to the electron transport system, two ATP will be formed. At the end of glycolysis and cellular respiration, the catabolism of one glucose molecule will yield 36 ATP for the typical cell. Let's summarize where these ATP come from. From glycolysis, there are two ATP that are directly made and there are four ATP from the hydrogen that NAD transports to the electron transport system. In the citric acid cycle, there are two ATP that are directly made. From the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA and from the citric acid cycle, there are eight NADH that are transported to the electron transport system. These eight NADH will help produce 24 ATP. There are also two FADH2 from the citric acid cycle that are transported to the electron transport system and they will help to produce 4 ATP. So if we add these up, 2 plus 4 plus 2 plus 24 plus 4 equals 36. 36 is the number of ATP that the catabolism of one glucose molecule will generate. 32 of these are from oxidative phosphorylation or aerobic metabolism and two of these are from anaerobic metabolism. Don't forget that carbon dioxide is produced in the citric acid cycle and water is produced in the electron transport system.